Well, this morning's passage is, is again, just, just kind of a launching point for this second half of the series, uh, and it's a very familiar passage. Uh, so again, let's, let's try to kind of absorb what it is that Paul is actually saying here. And as we, as we well, I'll, I'll have just uh, several things to say about this, but um, again, let's, um, let me first just read the passage. Romans 8, 28 through verse 30. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, if I were to ask you which verse do you think we're going to focus on here, do you think you could, you could point it out? Well, it's obviously verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, let me just say a couple things about this as we begin. This predestination is God's purpose for us, okay, to become conformed to the image of Christ. And I think sometimes we think that is going to take place in heaven and not on earth, but we need to realize that this is something he intends to take place on earth, although it won't be perfected on earth, it will be perfected in heaven, but he begins it as soon as he saves us. And his purpose is so that Jesus would be the firstborn or be the one who is the head or the one who has the preeminence over a group of brothers and sisters, you know, who are just like him, okay? So we are to bear his image. And that is, again, the testimony, the witness that God desires for the world. That's what advances the kingdom of heaven. But again, let, let's uh, back up to where we were before and let's get a little bit of a running start at this. Now, we've been looking at, at many different ways, the many ways in which God has poured his love out upon us. You know, he, he foreknew us, you know, which is he chose us in eternity. He set his love and affection upon us. He sent his son into the world to save us. Jesus redeemed us and through his work justified us. And again, that's a fancy word for saying that he's taken away our sins and he's given us a perfect righteousness so that the Father accepts us. We, we pass through judgment and now we're on the other side where God has adopted us into his family and he has made us the joint heirs of his kingdom. Now God has not only done that in principle, but he's also going to make sure that the kingdom that he has promised to us that we will receive. And so he sustains us in life. He provides all of our needs. He works everything together for our good, even our failures, even our sins. He preserves us from falling away. Now, we know our Lord Jesus Christ, as we, as we were looking at the work of God to save us, he also showed us his great love by giving himself for us. And I, I love what Paul has to say where, where he talks about Jesus as giving up the riches of heaven. He who was rich became poor for our sakes so that we might, through his poverty, become rich so that we might gain heaven. That is the love that Christ has for us. And again, as Jonathan Edwards said, that our Lord Jesus Christ, as he's contemplating the cup that he must drink, the cup of suffering, the cup of God's wrath, and realizing that the only way he could save us was by drinking that cup, was willing to do it because of his love for us. So the Father and the Son have poured their love out upon us but the Father and the Son have also poured their love into us. They gave us their Holy Spirit, okay, that we might love them, that we might love what they love. That's the reason why we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the reason why we want to be like him, but it's the reason why we are saved. So God has poured his love out upon us. He has poured his love into us. But the question is, why has he done 
all of these things for us? Well, as I've already said, it wasn't simply to make us safe. And, and that's the way it's interpreted by so many believers today, is I have my fire insurance, that's what God intended, now I can sit comfortably, and I'm going to make it to heaven, and that's all that matters. But we need to understand it is far more than that, far more than that. He did this, as I've said before, that we might become like Him. You know, that we might become like the Father. You know, Peter says we've, we've become partakers of the divine nature. He doesn't mean by that we become little gods, but that we might share His moral nature. And of course, that is exactly what Jesus expresses to us what He reveals to us. He is the one who came to explain the Father. Um, he is His express image. And the whole point of this is that we might, again, in our transformation, that we might begin to think like Jesus, speak like Jesus, do what Jesus would do. He poured His love out on us that we might share His image, that we might have that love that we see within the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have seen why we should love God, and that's because of His great love for us, but let's begin to look at how we are to love Him in return. And this may seem somewhat over the top, but this is exactly what, what the Lord intends, that we are to love the Father in exactly the same way that Jesus did which is more than just with our hearts, though that is very necessary, more than just in our minds, more than just with our words, but we are to love Him with our whole lives. That is what it means to be conformed to the image of Christ, which is what, as we've already read, God's plan was for us. So, in order to understand this, we first need to ask this question, how did Jesus love His Father? Well, obviously, he loved him with all his heart and with all the powers of his life. Now, you know, it's interesting when we, when we look through the scriptures, it, we, it, it's easy to find statements where we see the father expressing his love for the son. He does that on numerous occasions. One example was at Jesus' baptism where he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There's no doubt that the Father loved His Son. But Jesus, we know, also loved His Father. You know, it, it, it's hard really to find any statements to that effect. There is one, but we're going to see it again. He does it in far more than just words. He does it with His life. But when we think about the love that Jesus has for His Father, we, need, we realize, of course, first of all, that He loved Him as His eternal Son. Because remember, Jesus is the God-man, and as God, He was with the Father from all eternity, the eternal Son of God. And as the eternal Son, He eternally, infinitely delighted in Him. Uh, they were one another's greatest joy and pleasure from all eternity, and of course, the Spirit of God was as well. But Jesus also loved the Father as a man, and sometimes it's hard to make that distinction, but we need to to, we do need to make it. He loved the Father in His humanity. This was the obligation Jesus took upon Himself when He came into the world to do what Adam failed to do. Remember how God made Adam, put him in the garden, gave him one commandment to keep, which was to guard the garden and not to eat of the tree. And Adam was to express his love for the Father by obeying Him. But he failed to do that. Jesus comes into the world to love the Father in the way that Adam failed to do. Um, he came into the world to fulfill what, really all the commandments, but the greatest of which is the Shema. Remember, the Shema is the Jewish word for that particular commandment, which they consider to be the greatest commandment, which is expressed in the book that we're reading this month, Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Okay, that's what Adam was supposed to do. That's really what we're supposed to do. But that's what Jesus came into the world to do. And that is what he actually did. Jesus 
didn't just say that he loved the Father. He didn't just go around telling everybody, yes, I love God. I can only really, as I've said before, find one place in Scripture where he actually says that he loves the Father. Because the point is, it's, you know, words are cheap. He didn't just say it. He showed it. He showed the world that he loved him. He fulfilled the Shema by loving him with all of his heart, mind, and strength. As he says in John 14, verse 31, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Jesus loves the Father, and he shows him that love by obeying him. Now, you know, it wasn't just because he was obligated to do this that he obeyed the Father. He really loved his Father. He really delighted in obeying him. As we read in our call to worship in Psalm 40, where we see the Spirit of God speaking through David as a prophet, he's expressing the very things that, that apply to Christ. As I mentioned, the author to the Hebrews applies this to Jesus. He says in verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. This was his joy. This was his delight to serve, to honor, to obey the Father. On one occasion, Jesus said that obeying the Father was more satisfying to him, more fulfilling, more nourishing to his soul than, than his food was for his body. Again, that passage in John 4, 34, remember when the disciples went into the city of Samaria to get some food because they were hungry, and that was the only place they could get it. Jesus speaks to the woman at the well, and after she leaves, the disciples come back with the food, and they said, here, uh, Master, eat. And he says, I have food to eat from that you don't know of. And they're looking around, does somebody come and bring him food? And he said this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus loved obeying the Father that much. Now, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And righteousness simply means for doing the will of God. Well, this is what was, what was in his heart. And that's why he did his Father's will, was because he hungered for it, he thirsted for it, and when he did it, it satisfied him. Now, James tells us that as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. You know, as I was thinking about that, I was reminded that the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5 verse 6 tells us that the kind of faith that saves is the faith that works by love. You know, love is that which animates faith, gives life to it. Um, it's what makes it real. That's the reason why we trust Jesus is, we, is because we love him. That faith and love are virtually synonymous. So we can paraphrase James in this way. As the body without the spirit is dead, so also love without works is dead. Show me your love without your works and I will show you my love by my works. Well, I think that works, don't you think? The point is, Jesus didn't just say he loved the Father. He showed him that he loved him through his obedience to him. Now that, as I said before, is exactly what God intends for us. It's why he poured his love out on us. It's why he poured his love into us so that we would become like Jesus. Now getting back to our passage, Paul writes again, for those whom he foreknew in Romans 8.29, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. The word conform means to have the same form, to share the same likeness. Now, Paul understood that this was God's purpose. That's why he writes it. But it's also why he pursued it with his own life. Now, it, Remember earlier I read Philippians chapter 3. I'd like to come back to that. Paul, when he realized that his own righteousness wouldn't save him, you know, he, he gave up that righteousness that he might have Christ's righteousness. You know, not my works, not what I've accomplished, but what Jesus has done. You know, that is the gospel, of course, that Jesus has done everything necessary to 
make us right before God, to justify us. So he says this in Philippians 3, verses 8 and 9, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that is the gospel. And again, we don't want to confuse these two things. Remember what Luther said, you know, every, every week I preach justification by grace through faith alone, because every week my people forget. And Luther knew that because every week he forgot. We so easily confuse the two, and we fall into thinking that my works somehow are necessary to save me. Paul says they can't, they're nothing but rubbish. It's Christ and his work alone. But again, Paul knew, as Luther did as well, that if we have truly, genuinely been justified by God's grace, we will pursue Christ's likeness. We will seek to be sanctified. We will pursue holiness. And that's what we see in Paul. He goes on in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now think about this for a minute. Paul didn't want simply to know about Jesus. Now that is important. We need to read the Bible. We need to learn what he's like. We need to read books that explain it. You know, we, we read our theology books, we read our devotional books, and they tell us what Jesus is like. We need to learn those facts. But Paul wanted more than facts. He wanted to know him. He wanted to experience his life in his own soul. He wanted to have his heart. He wanted to live sacrificially as Jesus did. When he says he wanted to know the power of his resurrection, he wanted to know the power of the spirit of resurrection working in him, the spirit that made him alive. Remember, we were all dead before the spirit of God breathed life into our souls, and that life is that love. Paul wanted to experience that love and that power of the resurrection working in him to make him more like his Savior. But he also wanted something that we don't often think about wanting, and that is he wanted to know what it was like to suffer as Christ did, the fellowship of his sufferings, which means to suffer for doing God's will in the same way that Jesus did, being conformed to his death. We died with Christ, and we've been raised again to newness of life, which means we are alive now only to serve the Lord. Paul wanted to know what it was to die to himself and sin and to live for Christ, to live this kind of life. You know, we really gain no clearer view of who Jesus is than when we suffer as he did for the Father's honor, when we die to ourselves and live for his glory. Now, again, Paul always makes the right connections. Obviously, he's an inspired apostle of God, and sometimes we dismiss some of the other things we get so focused on justification by grace through faith alone, and that is very, very important that we forget about the implications of sanctification. But Paul says something here that we really do need to pay attention to. He says this, that he wanted to know Christ in this way so that he might attain to the resurrection from the dead. I was listening to a debate by Walter Martin and um, this Jesuit priest, and, and this Jesuit priest focused on this particular passage, and he says, look, here, Paul did not have an assurance that he was saved, and that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul knew that he was saved, but how did he know? He knew because he was trusting Christ, yes, but he also knew because he was giving his life to the Lord in his service that he, because he was pursuing to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, he was being conformed to his death. Because those things were true of him, he knew he had truly trusted in Jesus. And because of that, he knew he was going to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul here is, is, is not talking about the fact that there's going to be some raised and some not raised. He knew that everybody was going to be raised on that day. 
but he wanted to know that he would be in the resurrection of the righteous, those who belong to Christ. And his point is this, if there is no sanctification, if there's no pursuit of Christ's likeness and no growth into the image of Christ, then there's no justification. There's no salvation, okay? Sanctification always follows justification, and sanctification means growth into the image of Christ. And so Paul says he pursued this with all of his might, verses 12 through 14. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, the Puritans used to say that if you think you've, be you know, if, if you think you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but having believed in Him, you're just simply sitting around doing nothing and just waiting for the Lord to take you to heaven, then you haven't really found Christ because that pursuit after Christ that brought you to Him you will continue even after you come to Him. Uh, you will continue until you actually enter into that eternal kingdom. That is what Paul sought after in his own life. And again, I would remind you of those other passages. I run seeking to win the prize. You know, I, I, I beat my body and make it my slave, lest after I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul's not saying that I, I don't know that I'm a Christian, but what he's saying is that if I should stop pursuing the Lord and begin living a life of sin, then I never really knew Christ to begin with. So this activity of the Spirit of God working this love in us, drawing us out to Christ and Christ's likeness is how we know that we belong to Him. And Paul wants the Philippians and he wants us to understand that this must be our goal as well. He says in verse 15, let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, and what he means by that is mature, have this attitude. What attitude? The one he just expressed regarding himself. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Now, Paul is always enjoining, um, encouraging, exhorting, um, Christians, as he writes to the different churches, to do this very thing. Uh, he writes in Romans 13, verse 14, as we, um, yes, we read in our meditation, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. He writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, in reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. He writes to the Colossians, do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. You know, Jesus said exactly the same thing when he said to his disciples in Matthew 10, verse 25, it is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. You know, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. A Christian is a disciple of Christ. A disciple is one who learns from the master and who seeks to become like him. So the father set his love on us and poured his love out on us and in us so that we might become like Jesus, that we might love him like Jesus loved him. Now, I want to just simply close with one application. I'm sure that the Lord's already made many from the text we've just looked at. But if it's true that the Father has predestined us to become like Jesus, and if we are to love Him as Jesus did, then obviously it's not enough to simply say we love Him. We actually need to show that love through our obedience. John writes in 
Uh, 1 John um, chapter 3, verse, verse 17. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Now, if we do this, then like Paul, we can know that we are justified. We can know that we will attain to the resurrection of the righteous. John continues in that, just in that same passage. We will know by this, okay? When we don't just word, love in word and tongue, but indeed in truth, we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. Okay, we will know that we belong to the Lord. Now, since we're going to want to spend you know, some amount of time unpacking what it means to love like Jesus as we move along in this series, uh, I just want to apply this generally by asking a couple of questions. And I'll ask it in the plural because I'm asking myself the same question. Okay? Are we obeying Him? Are we obeying God? Are we keeping His commandments? Or are we allowing ourselves to do things that are wrong and not doing things that we know are right? Well, if we're going to pursue Christ's likeness, whatever we're doing that we know is contrary to His will, we need to put those things off and put them to death. And of course, whatever we're not doing that He calls us to do, we need to be putting these things on, okay? That's what it means to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lust. Jesus tells us in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he says in verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. I think that's, that's fairly obvious. We need to obey him. If we love him, we'll obey him. Jesus showed his love through his obedience. If we would be like him, we need to do the same. So let, let's reflect on this for a few moments in silent prayer as we prepare to come to his table. Because remember, as we come to the table, we are reminded in Scripture that um, we need to deal with our sins before we come uh, so that uh, we don't incur uh, the discipline of the Lord. So let, let's spend a few moments in, uh, in silent prayer.